Uh, I want to uh, welcome you all to uh, Pease. Uh, I see a lot of retirees out there. It's uh, good to see you. Last time we met, it was in a hangar, and both our hangars are under construction, so we moved over here to Loy, but I think it's uh, going to be a, a good environment for us to discuss a few things today. So let me start off with a couple of quick introductions. I'll start off with our Edging General, uh, Major General Dave Michaelitis, up front here. If you don't all mind just raising your hand as I call your name out, um, just so people can make some connections. Uh, is Terry Garnett here as well? Terry, are you here? On his way, okay. He's the National President of the Association of Civilian Technicians. Um, representing Senator Shaheen's office is Peter Clark. Representing uh, Senator Maggie Hassan is Kerry Holmes and Justin Troiano. Troiano? Okay. Uh, Congressman uh, Christopher Pappas. We have Patrick Carroll and Charlotte Harris. Is Charlotte, did she make it? No, she's with Custer. Okay. And representing Congresswoman Ann Custer is Tom Giacolo. All right, thanks very much. Um, I'll give you a brief history again, uh, how we got here. So back in August of 18, uh, we had some of our retirees and widows uh, express some concerns about their health. Uh, we responded by getting our, a group of experts together here at Peace, and we only have so many resources, so we partnered with a number of agencies around the base as well on the national level, and that became our Peace Health Working Group. So i like to uh, look at or acknowledge those, so I'm going to introduce those as well. First, our leader of that group, Lieutenant Colonel Derek Brindisi. Thanks very much. Uh, Mindy Mesmer from uh, New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody's here, but we'll go run through. Uh, Staff Sergeant Sarah Davidson, Public Health at Pease. Amanda Goulet, Bioengineering. Uh, from Veteran Services, we have uh, Bill Goudreau and Jamie Cummings. Veterans Affairs, uh, jo Joseph Lenart. Our Chief Aerospace Medicine, Lieutenant Colonel Petrowski. Uh, from the Agency of Toxic Substance Disease Registry, Gary uh, Perlman. National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, we have Dr. Miriam Calkins and Cheryl Estill. Uh, from Dartmouth College, Judith Reese. Uh, also a number of our retirees and uh, widows, uh, Nancy Eaton is here. Uh, Doris Brock, uh, Pamela Bapp, uh, Gary Enos. Uh, Peter Sandin, Ashley Williams. Uh, from University of New Hampshire, Carla Arminti. And from the Department of Health and Human Services, Karen Carver. Uh, let's see, we also have uh, Mass Sergeant Mark Filion from the Pease Health uh, Working Group uh, Bioengineering here. Is there anybody else that's representing an organization that I forgot? All right, so this group got together. We had a number of goals. The first one uh, was to hear from our, our folks here and what their concerns were. So back in December, over in the hangar, we actually had our listening session. And I think we had about 250 people show up for that. It was a little bit over two hours. And we heard a whole bunch of uh, heartbreaking stories that came out of that. Uh, but that uh, got our, our really uh, our focus for us. Um, from the Office of Veterans Affairs, uh, we actually had a registry started. And we'll hear from those folks today. Um, Another goal was to have a handout that you could bring to your physician to start a, a conversation. And finally, uh, we wanted to have a health study. And so we talked and we got our uh, support from our CODEL and we've submitted a letter to Secretary of Defense and the VA and uh, we're starting to make some progress. I don't have any details of what that health study is gonna look like, but I know we are gonna have a health study here and I would think it's gonna be next year sometime. So, uh, for our agenda that we're going to have today, we're going to try to update you on all those issues. So we'll start off with a service connection guide. Uh, I think Jamie Cummings from Office of Veteran Services will speak to that. We'll then have uh, Derek Brandisi, uh, Colonel Petrowski talked about understanding your health. We have some handouts for that and how to talk to your physician about health. Uh, we have our ATSDR, Gary Perlman will be speaking about, uh, there's a whole bunch of studies that are going on in our local area. And they all use the term P's, right? So we're looking for our study, as I mentioned here, but we're gonna call ours the 157 study so we can separate it out from, I believe there's five different studies that are going on right now. So we'll hear about those other studies as well. Um, from NIOSH, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Miriam Calkins speak about uh, some of the studies that they're doing. Uh, Derek will give us the latest we have on the 157 study. Again, we don't have a lot of information, but he's got a little bit for you. And then we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers as best we can with our subject matter experts. 
and then we'll finally spill out in the hallway. We have five tables uh, split up. So if you don't want to ask a question in front of everybody here, we'll have those experts go out in the hallway and you can speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. So does that sound good to everybody? All right, with that, then I'm going to ask Jamie Cummings uh, to come up. And if you don't mind, just uh, we are trying to capture this for a video, uh, and we have a microphone here that will help. So if you could be around here, that would be great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we sent out, if you're on our mailer that we have going on, we sent out um, this really great little fact sheet it's not little, it's 17 pages, it's kind of long. Um, but there's a lot of information. The law that governs the VA is probably like five or six inches thick, so this is the Reader's Digest version of how to file a claim. So um, if you could go to, um, on the right-hand side where it says Pease Air Force Base Health Concerns, and then um, Publications. And then bulletin, num I believe it's number four. Perfect, okay. If you didn't get a copy of this yet, we have some on our table out in the hallway. Um, there's a lot of information in here. So I just wanna hit a couple key points cause I could probably do like a four hour presentation on this for you. It would be very boring. I just wanna go through it quickly. And then I think the biggest takeaway is if you have questions, you need help, I want to get you connected to a veteran service organization. My agency, the Division of Veteran Services, VFW, American Legion, DAV, they all have veteran service officers that can help you. So if you take away anything today, you should get hooked up with the VSO so we can give you a hand. Even if it's just to answer a question, it's worthwhile reaching out to us. Um, so on this first page, uh, if we can just go to um, letter A, there's a couple different ways you can get service connected. And I think we're most interested in occupational exposure and contaminated drinking water. These are our two big ones that we get a lot of questions about. This handout has, it's like a step-by-step -step guide of what you need to do to file a claim. So the first one, occupational exposure. Second one is contaminated drinking water. We also have um, some folks that might have, maybe you were exposed to both, maybe you're not sure. We have some surviving spouses here that have questions. They think maybe their loved one died from a condition. All of these things are relevant. Um, if we could go to page three of the handout. This page talks about the different ways you can get service connected. You can get service connected, um, direct connection, secondary connection, aggravation, and presumptive. There is another one if you, um, it's kind of like a malpractice suit against the VA if you were injured at a hospital. That's not really pertinent to what we're talking about today. Direct service connection is for an injury or disability that happened while you're on active duty, while you're on drill or active or, or on annual training. A secondary connection is, I like to use maybe your knee as an example. You hurt your left knee, now your right knee is messed up. You have a lot of health problems with your knee, that would be a secondary condition. An aggravation would be a condition that you had before you went in the military and maybe you went in on a waiver and it was fine and then you re-injured it. That would be an aggravation. A presumptive condition would be something like the Agent Orange or the Camp Lejeune water contamination. Pease is not considered a presumption yet. That's something that is being worked on. It can unfortunately take quite some time. So we would be looking at a direct service connection for this contamination for you. To do that, you need really strong evidence from a doctor. And if we could skip to page 16, When you meet with a VSO, we help you gather evidence, then we submit your claim with you. Then we hurry up and wait for a response. The response could be approved or denied. There is an appeal process you can follow. But to have the best success with your claim, um, you want to have really good medical evidence when you're doing that. And this page on page 16 is the Nexus letter. This is something that you can go to your doctor and if, you're, if they're, the science is behind it and they support it, they can write a statement for you. This talks about some of the wording that the VA likes to see in that statement. 
It could be on letterhead, it could be in your progress notes, it doesn't necessarily have to be a standalone page. Typically a specialist will put it on letterhead and write some sort of statement for something like this, but it can, it's okay to be in your progress notes as well. So they're looking for an event that happened in service, so a contamination and exposure. Then they're looking at a present day diagnosis that so you have this condition still. Then the doctor can link it to your service. So for example, um, say the doctor did genetic testing on you and your form of cancer is not genetic in nature. They've reviewed your personnel records when you're on active duty and they agree that you were exposed to, exposed to some type of hazardous chemical or you, something that was contaminated. They can write a statement saying that it was a high probability, more likely than not related, something with those words. It doesn't have to be 100%. Um, if they weren't there when it happened, they're not gonna say this 100% absolutely is what happened. But more likely than not will do the trick, high probability of. Um, highly likely, that's very strong wording, highly likely. A strong nexus will show the doctor reviewed your records already, so your personnel, maybe your service medical records if you had symptoms that started while you're on active duty. And they can pull in um, different sorts of um, different research that people have already done. Maybe there was a study that was done that was similar that they can reference in the letter. This will make your statement very, very strong. So they can pull all this stuff in. If you have any medical journal articles that we can attach to your claim, that is also very helpful. So all of these things come together in this letter. And this is what you're going to need for a hazardous chemical or um, a contamination service connection, because it's not a presumptive condition yet. It would be really easy if it was a presumptive condition already, but since it's not, this is the way we have to do it for now. So I would say, as a VSO, don't wait to put your claim in. We don't know how long it's gonna take for it to become a presumptive condition, if it's going to become a presumptive condition. So this would be your best bet at the moment. Um, this can be very confusing. It can be very overwhelming. You may have a lot of health things going on right now. Hook up with a good VSO so they can help you wade through all of this and we'll make sense of all of it for you. We're here to help. Um, on the second page, or the next page, that'd be page um, 17, it talks a little bit more about the rationale that's needed. The VA needs to see a rationale. It needs to be black and white. There can be no gray area with this doctor's statement. So they can use statements such as, it's well known in the medical community, medical journals and research. Um, they can also rule out other possible ways that you got this condition. So like I said, it's not genetic. Um, I'm not a medical professional, so whatever. If the doctor's ruled out a bunch of different things and has, has already done a bunch of testing on you, they can put that in their letter, which also makes it quite a strong statement. Um, you should have your doctor add their credentials oncologist, environmental clinician, surgeon, hematologist, whatever their specialty is, that's also very strong. If they're a specialist, it's gonna hold more weight than someone who's in gen med, for instance. Um, so all of these things can be added to your letter. So again, you really, really, really should contact a VSO to help you with this. Maybe you've already started pulling some stuff together. Maybe you've tried to file a claim and you've been denied. We can do a file review on you and go through your evidence to say, okay, this statement is good, but it could be a little stronger. Maybe you can go back to your doctor and ask them to clarify this statement that they made. And maybe that will help you more than the document that you previously had. Um, other forms of evidence that you can use, maybe you could get some buddy letters from folks that you served with. Maybe you have your service treatment records. Maybe you have something already that you don't even realize that you have that a trained eye would catch very quickly if you brought it to a VSO appointment. Pictures can also count. Um, maybe you have some pictures of something that a uh, chemical you were using 
and you could use that in support of your claim. So any of these things can be used as forms of evidence and they're really, really important. The VA looks at service connection as a scale. It doesn't have to, the scale doesn't have to tip 100% in your favor, it just has to be a little over 50% in your favor. So when you start grabbing all these different pieces of evidence together, a doctor's letter, buddy statements, pictures, anything like that, that can tip the scales your way. And that's what the VA is looking to do. We have to give them good evidence. Um, okay, so again, I would like you guys to hook up with a VSO. We have all the contact information out on the table. Um, I think the biggest thing is don't let this overwhelm you. There's a lot of information here. You guys are gonna get a lot more information later on this afternoon. Let us help you. Even if you don't even know what questions to ask, come and see us. We'll pull information out of you. We'll ask you a series of questions to kind of get you where you need to be. Um, and I th think that's it. I don't know, are we doing question and answer right now or maybe later out in the hallway? I, I didn't know if that was appropriate for now, but sure, yeah. Okay. Yes, right here. Jamie, I, I had a question maybe related to the real status. Mm -hmm. As far as my understanding of the VA, it has to typically be Title 10 active duty or Title 32 <clears throat> on active duty of quarters, not just a regular drill drilling weekend. So it could be a drill weekend um, if you got a line of duty or you had something in your medical records if something happened. So it's not out of the question. It's easier if you were on active duty orders. Um, but it's not out of the question if you weren't. But that would be something to bring up if you met with the VSO to let them know what the, the scenario is. And if you do have any evidence or maybe you went off base for medical treatment, so you have that that happened at the same time, so we can kind of piece a timeline together for you to help you build a case. Yeah, absolutely, great question. And if anyone has any specific questions that they don't feel comfortable asking, we're gonna be out in the hallway. My director, Bill's here. Um, two of my other coworkers are standing up in the back, uh, back there. They'll be here to answer questions as well. We really wanna help you guys, so please don't hesitate. No question is a bad question, because if you're thinking it, someone probably else has thought it and asked it as well, so we'd rather you just ask us versus going you know, with a question that's been unanswered. All right, oh, yeah, one more question. So, um, like the Camp Lejeune water, has been addressed, but Pease hasn't. Right. Does people coming forward, like, I've never gone through the VA, but I've had cancer twice um, at a young age, and I was here through the 80s up until 2019. Okay. Um, but I've never filed anything with the VA. Does that help? When people file something like that, does that help make the case for, hey, you know, Pease water wasn't it that could. good? It could. Um, I would say also just for your your own coverage, being service connected with the VA can provide health care for you, um, which is really important. I would say look into it, um, especially you know cancer at a young age. It's not you know doesn't run in your family. All these things start popping into my head like, ooh, we need to get you in for an appointment to talk about this stuff. But it sounds like you should. If you haven't before, I would really suggest you meet with someone um, and. Camp Lejeune, that water contamination started in 1950 and it just became a presumptive in 2017. So I hope this doesn't take as long, but if you are looking to get service connected, following this guide, getting a nexus statement, pulling together other sources of evidence is really gonna be a good way to get service connected. Please don't wait 50 years to, you know, to look into this. You should do it now. That's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Back here. Oh. Just, uh, I just had a question. I went through the VA and uh, I wear two hats. I'm a 9 11 first responder. So the VA took the tinnitus because I was on the flight and I was an SP. Uh, mm -hmm. in, and they set me for World Trade Center on the program, which I'm in. And they said, uh, they certified it. They said, uh, actually, the VA was helpful. They said, if you would stand in there in the second plane, the tower was moved, and that's what happened with you, but because they couldn't go back that far. So that's why when you said, I hope it doesn't take 50 years um, for this, I can't presume, it. how far are we out from it? Because I'm not sure. Um, I, 
you can get service connected before it becomes a presumptive, you know, whatever list comes out with presumptive conditions on it. It's easy if you can say, I was at peace, I was in the right unit, unit, I was exposed to this contamination, it's a presumptive, I have the condition on the presumptive list, it's really easy to get service connected. If you meet all the requirements, boom, it goes through pretty quickly. But if it isn't a presumptive yet, it's not out of the question to get service connected. And that's the biggest thing I want you guys to know. Get hooked up with the VSO, look into this stuff now. Because if you can get support from your doctor and get a nexus, a really good nexus statement, it's not out of the question to get service connected now. But I wouldn't wait 50 years to look into it. That would be unfortunate. I think there's a lot of great benefits that could help you now. And it depends if you have a doctor that's supportive that can write you a statement. So did that, did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I think the other problem that I found is the doctors and physicians out there are not ramped up on this. And they weren't ramped up on the World Trade Center uh, toxic uh, dust, which I ended up doing a study on for them. And in this case with the water, uh, if you remember, I was the, one of the first people to get up there and, and tell you about that they were testing the water here back in the 80s. And actually, I'm also here for a couple of colleagues that were in the squadron. One was a New Hampshire State uh, Trooper, a mm -hmm. uh, that just died of cancer, and uh, a friend of here, another uh, law enforcement uh, officer who died. So uh, I, I don't like to, what I don't want to hear. I guess this may speak for everyone, is that it's going to take years to get this certified. The board of contamination was here back in the 80s, probably before. So when I just read this study, and the 1999 study, so uh, I think the group would like to hear, uh, you know, how long is this going to take? Is it going to be fast track? I just got off the phone with Chris, who's a chemist. State Director for Senator Richard Greenbaugh's office. I came up here from Connecticut. So he said they're working on the PFAS down there. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't work for the VA, so I couldn't even put a, a timeline on that. Um, but I would say if you can, if you have support from your medical team, you could look at service connection now and not waiting for it to become a presumptive. So. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I would I would say work with your medical team, get the documentation, put the claim in now, and not to wait. If I had my way, this would go through very <laughs> this would go through very quickly for you. My director would like to say something. Yeah. So the, the process is a lengthy process, unfortunately. The VA has to do a lot of homework and do a lot of research, but all that process starts with studies. And that's what we're getting into. So I think we are in the right place that we need to be. We're doing the studies that need to be. And it's not being done just here. Studies being done all over the United States. At all places all over the United States. So it's being addressed. They're going to look at the studies. They're going to look at the science. And the VA is going to make a decision. I've heard potential five to seven years before a decision is solidly made. But again, it's going to be based on the VA's determination as to whether or not they believe the science is credible. And then they'll make a decision similar to what they did with Cambridge. To that gentleman's point, though, other folks that I have spoken to, it is very difficult to get an oncologist or a surgeon who perhaps maybe is at Mass General or Brigham and Women's and isn't as involved in it as we all are here in New Hampshire to put their reputation on the line and say, it's possible, it might have happened, could be. That's a very difficult thing. I agree with that. The only thing I would tell that doctor is you're not making any decisions here. You're not deciding the case for the VA. All you're doing is giving your opinion. That's all that the VA is asking for. They're looking for a credible opinion. And I understand what you're saying an open challenge, but that's all the VA is asking for is credible opinion. That person is not going to be giving you the benefit. That doctor is not going to be doing it. Can we just open up to one more question? I just want to make sure all our presenters get a chance. So uh, we'll just go with one more and then we'll move on. But we'll have another space at the end. This isn't so much a question, but it's a statement. Having gone through the last 34 months of medically uh, retiring out of the United States Army, I can tell you that to get a VA doctor to write a statement with words like more than likely, and they're wonderful. I go to Web River Junction for everything. It is extremely difficult yes, because they do work in a medical community where their reputations are on the line. 
and there's small communities. Yep. And those reports go to the state of New Hampshire with their names on it. So it, it's great to say five to seven years, and I understand what you're saying, sir, but it, it is extremely hard to get those doctors who do genuinely want to help us to use words like more than likely, absolutely, in those terms. Right. And, and their hands are tied. Sure. So just throwing it out there. No, we need that perspective, so yep. thank you. All right, uh, Derek, I think you're up next. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. So um, thank you, Jamie, for your presentation. I hope everybody had a chance. When you walked in, there's a document out front. It's titled Understanding Your Health. And so as Jamie pointed out that um, in order to file a claim, you need to provide evidence. And so what this document is geared towards doing is just to try to give you a little bit of information to empower yourself so you can control your own health and your own health outcomes. So if I could walk you through this document just for a few minutes, if we would go back, for those of you that attended the December 8th uh, meeting a year ago in the hangar, uh, the conversation I think started about PFAS and PFOA water contamination, but as you recall, the, the conversation ended with many people uh, talking about occupational health exposures and what they were exposed to during their time serving here at Pease. So this document here is really to try to address some of those occupational health concerns and try to give you the information that you may be able to use in order to have a conversation with your physician. So the first link here is a, um, it's a link that focuses on occupational health hazards. So these are military occupational hazards that have been identified across the spectrum. So if you went to that link, you could learn more about uh, occupational health hazards, and some of you that were in some of these environments get a better understanding of what you may or may not have been exposed to. If we scroll down just a little bit here, <clears throat> for all of you that served in the Air Force, in your medical records, you should have two documents if you were on an occupational health program. One was known as a 2755, which is now known as the OHEAD. The other document is a 2766, which is now known as the COHER. So if those of you that have retired you know, less than, well, more than five years ago, you would have a 2755 or, and or a 2766 in your medical records. Um, so how do you gain access to that? If you go to archives.gov, we could click on that, sir. So while, while it thinks, I'll explain a little bit. When you go to archives.gov, there'll be a link there for veteran services records. Behind that, once you click on that, there'll be another button that specifically allows you to request your medical records. So veteran services records in the middle there. <coughs> Requests medical and health records. So this. So if you were to click on there, you can uh, request your medical records, and I think Ms. Brock has done that. I think you said five to six weeks before you get a five to six weeks before you get a copy of your, of your medical records. Now, in those medical records, you should have those two documents. So the 2755 is a document that our bioenvironmental shop would um, annotate any occupational health hazards that you um, were exposed to depending on your AFSC. So if you were working on the flight line and you were exposed to hazardous noise, the 2755 would identify the hazardous noise levels um, that were um, identified and what the protective measures are. So you know, wearing hair protection, for example, that's a protective measure. The public health shop then takes that 2755 and then they, they, they develop what is known as a 2766 and that's the medical surveillance program that you put on. So using the same example of a, of a hazardous noise environment, the public health shop would require that you do hand, annual hearing exams. And that's how the public health would monitor you during your lifetime um, in that shop for that specific um, health hazard. So again, if you were 
working in another shop, say fuel cell, and you were exposed to benzene or another um, chemical or heavy metal, um, in your 20, the 2755 would one identify that, the 2766 would identify what medical surveillance programs you were put on. So in that case, you'd have, we'd take blood samples to monitor your blood, your blood levels. You can use those documents to start to have a conversation with your physician about what your exposures were and uh, whether or not you exceeded any action levels uh, based upon the, the, the medical surveillance requirements. If we scroll down. So, and just keep in mind in that medical record, all of your lab results, all your hearing exams should all be in that medical record. So it'll quickly identify whether or not you had uh, levels exceeding the action levels. <clears throat> so in order, again, to give you more information, better information, we have two other links here, one by ATSDR and the other one by ToxNet. If you go to those links, those links are just um, federal resources so you could look up benzene or look up chromium and, I, and, and identify and learn more about what some of the target organs were. So we heard conversations a year ago about some folks who uh, may have been diagnosed with certain types of cancers. Well, if you were exposed to a certain metal, you can go learn more what, whether or not your cancer is associated with that type of metal by going to these by going to these two links. So again, the whole goal is to empower you with information so that you can make um, choices when you meet with your physician. The last half of the document is focused merely on the PFAS and PFO conversation. Uh, we know that uh, there was uh, PFAS that was found uh, back in 2014 in the public drinking water supply. ATSDR has a lot of great resources around patient information, conversations to have with your physician. I think someone mentioned already that physicians in Boston may not be aware of this. You're absolutely right. Physicians in Boston, Massachusetts really hasn't even addressed this issue yet, the PFAS and PFOA issue. Um, I know that because I, I work in Massachusetts for my full-time job. So you can take this information when you go meet with your physicians and start to educate them and inform them about maybe some of the exposures that you may or may not have had during your time here at Pease. Any questions? Ma'am. So, um, that 27, whatever, um, I retired in 2017. Mm -hmm. I've been at the space. I was here a year um, from 79 to 80 after duty. And then I came back in December 2001. So, I was here when we were told about this PFAS being in the water. Does that 27 something state that? So the, the medical records, to my knowledge, will not have the PFAS, PFOA exposure. It would, that would not be on the 2755 or the 2766. Those two documents are specifically for occupational health exposures. So not for exposure to the drinking water that was found in 2014. Sir. Approximately what year was this program initiated in the Air Force? I would have to find out when. I, I did ask that question, and the folks that I talked to said that this program was in place all through the 80s and 90s. I can't speak to the 70s, though. They had a hazardous communication program uh, back in the 80s, and some of the retired chiefs uh, who, have I, who I have talked to said that these were programs that they were well aware of in the 80s. Whether or not they heeded some of the precautions, that's a, that's a different conversation. And these are supposed to be available in your medical records? They should be in your, if you are a part of a surveillance program. So if you were working in finance, you wouldn't have a 2755 or a 2766 because there was no occupational health exposure or concern. Well, the reason I asked is I retired in 93, a few years back, and uh, I've never heard of this program. I've send out a copy of my medical records and due to a fire at the, uh, wherever they kept them many years ago, I ended up with only three physicals in 38 years. And there was none of these forms in it, so I, it's all new to me. You know. If I could adjust two things. So I started my career in 1993 in public health. Um, these programs were in place in 1993. That I do know because that's when I started my career. Um, as far as a fire, I did hear that there was a fire and that there were a lot of records that were lost. I don't know if those were medical records or personnel records, but I know that there was a fire 
um, years ago that, medical, that some records were lost. But I would encourage you to go to the archives.gov website and request your medical records and take a look at those. And happy to help you review those as well if you need, to, if you need me to. Ma'am? Are all medical records for the Air Force in that archives.gov? From what I was instructed by NGB, yes. Oh, so they go back quite a number of years is what you're saying. Right. So, oh, thank you. Yep. So does a widow have access to her husband's medical records? I believe so. Yes, Doris, could you yes. ask that question? Yes. Whether a widow has access to those records. Yes, you do. It's just um, a, it's a classification when you file for the medical records. It's um, un, un, not remarried widow. OK. And so, but these two forms you're talking about have nothing to do with the drinking water contamination. That's right. That's correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Great. I'm going to turn it over to Carol Petrowski. We picked up something on our way to a doctor's appointment today. Now, unlike some people in this group, People here are pretty fired up, very educated. Most people spend more time considering what oil they're putting in their car, or what type of antifreeze to pick up the gas station, or looking through the circulars they got in their mailbox before they head off to a doc's appointment. We're all very, very busy people. Many of these exposures, whether PFOS or occupational health exposure, are cr cause chronic things. It's not like you fell down and broke your ankle and you can't walk. You have a sore shoulder. You have just fatigue. Maybe your doctor told you your kidney functions are a little bit off. That's where we rely on some of the great, uh, wonderful things that some of the folks here have done and are available. To understand your health. If you were in an occupational health exposure program and you have some of those documents, you can bring them in. Also, say you find that, hey, you know, I was uh, one of the guys who worked in the fuels and had a lot of exposure to this one particular substance. Well, down here you can pull some of this specific information on that substance, bring it into your doctor when you go in. Other thing when I was out there looking at the desks that uh, Public Health will be coming up and talking a little bit later. One paper says, talk to your doctor about exposure to PFOS or PFOA. PFOS, PFOA is a very new thing that doctors are getting educated about. Right now, the, work, the United States is in the fix of dealing with this opiate epidemic. And all doctors have to do so many hours every year on opiates. We're not doing educational, required educational um, time on PFAS, PFOA yet. It'll get there. But this is where you, as the patient, no one cares more about your health than you do. Your doctor may or may not know a lot about it. He might, but you can bring stuff in, such as one of these forms. You can educate yourself. There's another great one here. How are people affected? And even another one that I found when I was out there taking a look at the table, this one here actually shows that, hey, guess what? PFOS, PFOA is in a lot of things. It is in our Teflon pans. How many people have Teflon pans at home? How many people ate at McDonald's? Okay, guess what? Some of our food products, some of the packaging, has PFOS, PFOAs in it. Uh, it's not just fire uh, retardant material or fi and actually and some of the fire retardant. How many people have one of those cool uh, Columbia jackets that wick off water? Guess what? There's PFOS, PFOA in that and some of those things. So many of our water repellent substances had those. So it's ubiquitous. And we're now dealing with, hey, we used this, maybe it wasn't the best thing to be doing. So when you come and see your docs, what do you need to do? Number one, write down your concerns. You're coming in for a 15, maybe a 30 minute appointment if you're lucky. How many people actually said, hey, this is what I want to address with my doc? Because most of the time what I experience is people come in, they have all these worries and concerns, and they see one of these things here. All of a sudden the cone of silence goes up. I'm like, do you have any questions? My shoulder hurts a little bit. No, nothing else. So oftentimes the white coat or the stethoscope, people just all of a sudden, they get nervous. They forget to ask their questions. Or if you have a lot of questions, maybe you don't have enough time. If you write some of these things down, your doctor will have a better chance to either go through it, or if you don't have enough time to go through multiple issues, 
he needs a little bit of time to go through your records, do a little research. Or if you're trying to get that Nexus letter, which I haven't written the Nexus letter yet. Fortunately, in the emergency department, I don't typically do that, but I've done primary care clinics on active duty before. Uh, you know, that'd be something that your primary care doctor may not be familiar with. Even we have awesome, incredibly smart folks all throughout the Boston area, world class. Most of them have never written a letter for Nexus letter. So you have to help educate them. You know, the military does a lot of really dangerous things. We do it really well, but most people don't know what you do. But you do. So help educate the doc. You know, things like if they're going to do a blood test, why are we doing a test? What are the steps? Is there any side effects? Anybody have colonoscopy? You know that bowel prep has a little bit of side effects. <laughs> that jar of go lightly, I think they also call it trot quickly. <laughs> so you need to know the side effects. Uh, and when you do get the diagnosis, what are we going to do with that information? Or if you're like, hey, I think I got exposed to this, I need this letter, you need to tell the doc, this is why I need you to give an opinion that this may be more likely than not, and this will help me in this manner. He may not understand the VA system at all. Um, and as docs, many of them are very scientific, and they're like, well, if I can't connect dot A, B, and C, then I can't write this letter. He said, well, no, they're not asking you to 100% prove it. They're saying, is there a likelihood that my exposure to the burn pit, my exposure to these chemicals may have caused this problem. I think it is. Here's why I think it is. So educate your dog. You'd be a surprise at maybe how willing they are once they understand what you're doing because the military does things very different. The VA is not normal to most people that have never served. Um, so there's a lot of good things out there that you have to be the advocate and spend 10, 15 minutes. Some of the people here have spent a lot of time and are very well educated, and many of our service members that have had some challenges that had to work through the VA system are very good at that. Uh, there's a lot of great resources, making sure you plug in with your uh, veterans uh, disability officers to kind of go through this and say, hey, what, what else do I need? Uh, I was reading an article about, uh, recently it came out about someone that was exposed to uh, the, phone, the firefighting phone, and he had a picture of him in downrange, you know, with firefighting foam, a bunch of firefighters, and they had foam all around them, they were working on their gear. Well, that would have been a supporting document that you could write to your doctor and said, hey, I've been exposed, here's proof. So those are some of the things to work with your doctors, because many of these things are very vague. You know, your, our kidneys, they don't hurt typically until you're having significant problems. Autoimmune stuff, it's hard to pin it down. So many of the stuff that, in cholesterol, well, is the PFOS causing your cholesterol, or is it the Big Mac you just ate? Lots of different things, but you have to help educate folks. Questions? See, I have my stethoscope. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that's our response to what we heard in December, where we talked about early intervention. How do you get that dialogue on with your doctor? How do we get a test done ahead of time so we can find out the problem the first begin? So thank you both for doing that. So I'm with the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry. It's a federal public health agency uh, located in Atlanta, Georgia, and we have 10 regional offices. I'm from the Boston office in Region 1, which covers all of New England. So I'm going to talk to you today about many things. The first thing is about some of the PFAS contamination that we found on the base. Primarily, it's going to come from a document that we released for public comment. It's actually called a health consultation. You may have seen this. Um, so this looks at drinking water exposures from 1993 to 2014. And again, PFAS, just, just so you know, it's, uh, it stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It's a compound that was used in firefighting foam, also known as AFFF for aqueous film forming foam, sort of a mouthful. But let's just, I'm going to go right into this so we can go into the next slide. Um, so we had sampling data that was collected in 2014. EPA had identified this compound as a contaminant of concern, and because of that, they suggested uh, entities start sampling for it. So it was sampled for on base, and it was found to be quite elevated in one of the three wells that services the Pease Trade Port. There's three wells, the Haven, the Harrison, and the Smith. The Haven well is the one that had the highest level. 
As an aside, that well was also contaminated in the past with very high levels of trichloroethylene, or TCE, which was a degreaser known to be used on the base. In early 2014, the Haven well again was determined to have elevated levels, and then it was shut down. So we needed to determine what were people exposed to prior to 2014, which there was no sampling data, and people didn't really have this on the radar. So we developed what's known as a mathematical model. It's just a simple thing where we had the three wells here, and just assume that each well contributed equally to this main storage unit, and that all the endpoints in the distribution system have the same concentration. So we call it a simple mixing model. So that approach then allowed us to determine what levels of people were exposed to in the past, and we had developed a, a model. And on the next slide, this table depicts what those models, the maximum levels, were. And so this is um, the concern right here is PFOS, PFOS, perfluorooctanoic sulfuric acid. So the, the health-based comparison value of the HPCV is, is quite low here, you can see. But the numbers that we found are really quite high. So it was elevated at that point, and it's probably elevated from that point going back in time. We don't know how far back in time, but we looked at it as if it was that value back to 1993. Some of the other contaminants were also looked at, not really above a concern. Some don't have comparison values, but we had looked at them nonetheless. And this goes over in time. What we also have in comparison, though, on the next slide, we can see we did some measuring of the data that uh, Department of Defense and New Hampshire DES, Department of Environmental Services, had collected from 2014 through May of 17. And these are actual samples. So this is after the Haven well was shut off. And these are some of the numbers we're seeing right now. And so you can see the levels are quite low. There was one max, it was right around that number, but the levels have gone down significantly. Working with the Department of Defense, the Air Force, and DES, they've instituted the installation of a treatment system that's really taking out these contaminants. And we look forward to the time when that Haven well can be put back online when it takes out all the rest of the contaminants. Because of the, uh, the Peace Trade Port also has two child care centers, we also want to look at what is the numbers um, of contaminants in those wells. On the next slide, uh, we can see that the Great Bay Kids Company and Discovery Kids, um, we looked at the levels of contaminants and they're all below the ATSGR comparison values. We know that New Hampshire has developed maximum contaminant levels, the fairly new. We had based our numbers on what was known as a maximum minimum risk level, which came out of our toxicological profile. Um, and so our numbers may not be quite the same as New Hampshire, but they're very similar in many cases. So it's, it's good to know that now contaminants are not at levels of concern. In the past, they were. Um, on the next slide, just sort of the bottom line of the results of this consultation, which looked at the drinking water contamination of the PFAS, workers who spent any time on the base, as well as children in the attending the daycare centers, were exposed to levels of PFAS that could result in harmful effects to their health. Um, so we also wanted to indicate that um, although the Haven well was shut down, there were still very low levels of PFAS coming into some of the public water system. It is at such a low level that it's not expected to result in any health concerns. But we just want to let you know that it's not zero. They're actually now able to detect these concentrations or these contaminants down to the parts per quadrillion, which is amazingly low. Parts per trillion is low, but quadrillion is just astronomically low. But so the further you go, you probably can still find it. Um, so after this discussion, you know, we have um, tables set up on the side. We have a lot of fact sheets to discuss health effects of PFAS exposure, talking to your doctor about PFAS exposure, the results of these consults, and also what is an exposure in general. And also just want to say that if anyone has any questions and you want to talk privately, feel free to call me. I have my contact information up there. I know sometimes it's sensitive information, and, and we understand that. It's, we're glad to talk to you at any time. So now that's the drinking water levels for PFAS on the base. We're going to go switch gears a little bit to talk about some of the studies you may have heard of. And on the next slide, I'm going to discuss these studies here. <coughs> so we have the PEAS study, 
exposure assessments, multi-site study, and then the two consultations. The first one was looking at public water, and the next one is going to look at the private wells, which is private wells that are within one mile of the radius of the Air Force base, which we're working without the Air Force on that. So let's just go right onto the next slide here. So the Pease study. The Pease study um, is looking at residents that are exposed to drinking water contamination, primarily, exclusively PFAS in the drinking water. Recruitment is ongoing now. People can enroll in the study. There are exclusion criteria such as you could not have been a firefighter and you could not have worked with this. You could not have worked with the eighth triple F as part of your work. But if you were active duty on base, you were eligible to be in the study. There is a timeline at which you must have been on base, and I'll go over that in a few minutes. Um, but the reason why we're doing this study and all of the others is because really PFAS is an emerging yeah. contaminant, as EPA indicated, and we really don't have a good handle as to what are the health effects that occur after an exposure to this. We have some idea looking at animal models, some idea looking at some studies as a CH study. We want to have a comprehensive understanding with clarity what do these compounds cause. So that's the gist of this. I want to also indicate, I'm talking about something known as the multi-site study. The PEAS study is going to be part of the multi-site study, but because PEAS was the first um, exposure that we looked at, it's going to be looked at more thoroughly, perhaps, than the other ones. We're going to look at them in total to get more but they know epidemiologically power to see what is the health impacts of this exposure. So I'm going to discuss those shortly. But again, I want to go on to the next slide to talk about if you wanted to join the PEAS study, who is eligible? Adults 18 or over of the first category who worked or attended a day, um, school on the PEAS trade port any time from January 2004 through May of 2014. So you could have spent time before that, but you must have had some exposure during that window. So you could have been there in 93 through 2005, any time, as long as some, any amount of time you spent on there. Um, in addition, we're looking at those who lived in Newington. Newington had private wells. Some of the private wells were contaminated by the plume that migrated off the site. So we're looking at that criteria slightly different. If they spent any time from January 2004 through the present, and they had a private well with documented PFAS contamination, they can be in the study. We're looking to accumulate perhaps a thousand people in the study. We have a ways to go, and we're hoping to achieve that. If another age group is the children that are four through 17, and they attended one of the two um, daycare or child care centers, any time, again, from this time frame, the reason why that stops is after May 2014, the Haven well was shut off, and contamination was reduced. Um, or born or breastfed by a mother who had uh, meets the eligibility criteria above. We will also look at a small group of adults who were never exposed to these contaminants. Generally, that's a comparison group to see if their rates are different than others. Um, so that's some of the eligibility criteria. You know, questions anytime. I don't want to. Okay. So on the next slide, I just want to look at just so when we get the study starts. We'll be collecting various things, um, urine, blood, there'll be some medical testing. All the information collected will be coded, and no personally identifiable information will be recorded in the file. It cannot be self-identified to any one individual. It'll be used as a group. However, those who participate in the study will get their own results sent to them that they can then share with their physician and see how, you know, what does this mean for me? Um, again, we want to use these results to help look at what are the health effects related to PFAS exposure. And once the study does conclude, we will have a public meeting. And we will discuss this in a report to discuss what we have learned from the PEAS study. Um, so next slide indicates what are the type of um, tests. Again, we're looking at blood and urine, some body measurements. Um, there could be a variety of things that are measured in that case. Serum cholesterol, maybe one of those. Asking about medical history. And we will also be looking at um, some of behaviors in child participants. There's some indication that this may impact some developmental issues among children if we want to capture the entire suite of possibilities in this case. Um, 
There are benefits to being enrolled in the study, and the next slide highlights those. Um, again, we're trying to help have clarity as to what are the health effects following PFAS exposure, sort of entering into the base of scientific knowledge here. Individuals, as indicated, will get the results sent to them individually. They can discuss that with the doctor. And there is a gift card option for those who participate up to $75. They can get that um, you know, as an incentive. And then in the next slide, this is just a summary of the process. I want to just go through this. So we've already had the community engagement working closely with the community assistance panel, the CAP. They've been very helpful in this case. Um, we're now in level two, which is recruitment phase. Data collection will occur once we have recruitment finished, and we'll go through the sequence of the seven steps. That just encapsulates uh, quite nicely the process that we're being involved in the study. Any questions? Um, so on the next slide, then, if you did have questions about this, there's three ways. On this slide, you can find out phone number, email, or website. In addition, if you are interested in joining the study and you want to enroll, contact me at the table outside, and I'll give you a phone number to call. And they can hook you up and get you enrolled in the study. But there's some criteria. Again, it can't be a firefighter. It couldn't have been exposed to the foam. But if you want to be enrolled, feel free to contact me, and we'll get you um, the phone number for that. A any questions here? Oh, yes, please. My name is Lou Archambault. I was here on uh, the uh, first hearing back in uh, December um, 2018. But back in 2014, I received a letter from the Office of the Secretary of the Air Force, and it was pretty much, don't worry about the water. We got it under control. Okay, don't go acting out, don't get yourself tested or anything else. And what, um, what happened here is um, Senator Shaheen and a few others had written a letter regarding, um, excuse me, I get a little nervous because I'm a little upset because of what I'm hearing. No one paid attention before this. When I was here that, that time, in December, I brought up the fact that I got a person from the civil engineer representing the government who I took around to find all these spots that were classified and what had uh, what chemicals were in that. Doris Brock's husband happened to work at the facility where I had them open up the lid and say, how often do you pump this out, the hydraulic fluid? Six, six seconds of silence. Okay? That means never been pumped out. You're going back and you're limiting it to the parameters of 2004 and beyond, but we stop here, begin 2014, because all is well. Nothing was well. Nothing. The organization that you re report to here um, is the uh, Agency for Toxic Substance Diseases. Again, it's... Um, it's an advisory, non-regulatory organization, okay? It has its administrative functions. I've seen that in 2010, they had a $78 million budget. That was 2010. Um, they don't um, give, um, they, they only make recommendations, okay? You only make recommendations. You don't have any solutions. We just going to gather all the information, get big bucks, and hang it in there. But in Senator Sheehan's letter, she wrote the um, on, on December 13th, five days after that December 7th hearing, this letter comes out, and it's aimed at the um, Agency for Toxic Sun Substance Disease Registry signed by Shaheen, Senator Shaheen, Mikowski, and a bunch of others, okay? They'd already made the deal for these people to be doing that survey. You people will be doing that survey. I'm disgusted, disappointed, and outraged. Can I say more? One of the things they highlight in their little, um, in your little um, blip is the fact World Trade Center registry for 9-11 attacks. The registry contains more 
Um, then emergency response personnel who were involved in rescue and recovery effort and study of health efforts uh, to disasters and development of public uh, health. A lot of BS, okay? Ask this guy. He was at 9-11. He was at ground zero. He got anything? No! Zero. Huh? Zero. Let me, let me just, I don't know. Let me just uh, try to help. Uh, sorry, not to go on. Um, you put the parameters 2004 to 2014. And the World Trade Center Health Program, because you're involved in that, they went all the way back. And I don't see any reason here at Pease why you limit that window. Because you got people here from the 80s, like us, the 70s, and most likely 60s. And in your first slide, it talked about most likely if you, you know, there was contamination back then. And like I said in my testimony, sure that was. They came around to base housing with testing the water every two weeks back in the 80s. So somebody needs to relook at this, especially based on your first slide. I, I would just like to say, though, this is just one study. You saw there's five studies going on in the area. I understand. This one is really targeted, I believe, uh, with Senator Shaheen's stuff. Uh, it was. Daycare centers, they have some goals that they're trying to get. Uh, the study for the 157th is not up there. We have a way, we're going to craft that still uh, with our partners. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, who those are. So um, we need to hear your voices, but realize this is just one of a few studies. So I think you have five up there. Ours would be a sixth one. Um, I will tell you, P's when it comes to, now this is really the PFAS PFOA. Our study is going to go beyond that and look at occupational health exposures as well. But uh, we're kind of the epicenter for this stuff here. Um, the Air Force has promised uh, to give us clean drinking water. Uh, they're also cleaning up the aquifer as well. There's lots of plants that are around here for that. Um, so I think they're, they're doing their best, uh, but I, I think we need to take it to the next level. These studies will do that as we look at the health effects of all of this. So don't be too frustrated that maybe this isn't targeting your interest. It's one of well, six studies. Well, year, that's all, okay. not the interest of the year. Yes, but... Um, so I, I am seeing the health care of the, uh, the daycares. Yes. Okay. I brought my kids to the daycares. They were born in 94, 95, so they were there 95, 96. So they were no longer there when this other stuff was going on. So I guess my point is, is the daycare, the daycare started earlier. It wasn't like at the beginning of the days, but they started earlier. I think 93 was the first tenant that came on to the old it was. Air Force base. Yes, it was. So I'm just wondering where the 2004 came from. Yeah. Because with that one there, I know my kids, they're not eligible as far as that comes Because they I, were, when it first started. I don't now, know. It's possible, though, the results of the study. It's just a sample, and they may be eligible. I'm not sure. Right. Will. This is sort of like the first phase of studies. We need to know what do we know now, looking at this exposure. One of the issues with the timeline is if someone drinks water with PFAS in it, and they stop drinking water with PFAS in it, it can stay in the body, and half of it goes away in eight years. So it's an issue of how long it retains in the body and gets out of your body. So we looked at half-life issues, how long it takes till half goes away. So that's why we went with 2004. I, I understand the concerns people have a past exposure. And I, you know, I've been exposed to chem chemicals and I know it's a very unsettling feeling. I really understand that. Um, but right now we're trying to do sort of baby steps. You know, what do we know now about this chemical for this duration of exposure, which is that be the highest level of exposure? And what can we find out from there? And then from there, maybe bridge on to further past exposures. But if you go further back in time, we won't be able to determine what's in the blood anymore because that would have gone out. We're not sure what it was in the past. So we can't really say with certainty if, if a health effect is related to past exposure because we don't know what they are yet. So first we need to see what are the exposures, what are the outcomes that could occur, and based on that, maybe we can then say this fingerprint of listed <coughs> items, if you have these things, maybe that's because you had PFAS exposure. So I mean, it's a complicated mix. You know, Some of them, it could be increased serum cholesterol, Women could have more trouble getting pregnant. It could affect the hormones in the body. Um, it could also affect immunology. So sometimes kids may have a harder time getting a vaccination to take 
and there's some indication it may be linked to some cancers. So there's a variety of things we know from animal studies, but we need to have more clarity looking at these, these human investigations. So again, just bear with us. This is the beginning stages or perhaps more work that needs to be done, but I, I understand your concerns and I, I do feel it. I, I do. Isn't it pertinent to say that you went and got your PFAS blood testing during the time that was made available for free to go? and you served prior to 2004, you most certainly can be in that P study. Yes. Oh, that's from the New Hampshire the, the Correct. Yeah. Speaking that, of that, that's the specifically first that confusion, they probably should not have called it the P study, but they have. This was the meeting that took place last week. If you had your blood tested when that came out in the newspaper, when it came out on many other social media, if you worked at P's, you went and got your PFAS test done, which my husband did. You then are entitled, and we have signed up, and are in this PEAS study. So I think that's an important parameter. You. You're looking great. at 2004, yeah. 2014, and those of us that were here in the, in the 90s go, wait, what happened to us? But if you got yourself tested, then you can be in that study, correct? Yes, and correct. the reason why P is linked to this is because for all intents and purposes, you know, there's a lot of information that the AFFF usage on P's resulted in contamination. So that's how the name gets tied to it. You know, that's how it's called the P study. Right. But it doesn't necessarily mean, like for instance, new and residents can join up. They don't knock on P's, but their contamination came from P's. But if you clarify this gentleman's just to add in, yeah. you went and got yourself tested when that was available. Yeah, the serum testing, yes. You most definitely are, can sign up and be in that study. Right, that's the first round of people we're going to choose from. A thousand people. we get that depleted and there's still room for more, we'll have other people involved. Should that be clarified? When exactly. You said that the, the study encompasses 2004 to 14, right. uh, maybe uh, a sub paragraph saying or subline saying if you, unless you had the uh, blood test done back in the 2017 time frame. That seems to be a red hot point for for those of us prior to 2004. Right. So you could if you clarified that and said did you go and have your PFAS testing done and if yeah. you did then you are in that study. One phone call away to get in it even if you retired in 1990, 92, 93. Is that a it yes is. or no, correct? Yeah, that, that is accurate. I mean, okay. ideally, it was for people that were exposed during that time frame, so we reduced the half life issues. But if you joined up and became part of the serum testing that New Hampshire DHHS enrolled people in, that's another subset. Right. It isn't listed per se that way, and I'm not quite sure why. Uh, okay. I'm not the subject matter expert for the PEAS study. Um, but I, if I can't answer that question more thoroughly, I'll be glad to get back to you on that. I, I know what you're saying. No, I think I answered it. No, I, I, no, I agree, but I, I understand. So my question to my agency is, so why doesn't the literature say this when we're recruiting people? I don't have an answer to that. I'm sorry. Because you got the limit, Dan. Well, people that, you, I, we got letters in the mail, there's no doubt. But I don't think we're limiting them now. I think they're already being asked to join. If no, they're no, exactly. That's oh, I, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. If you were part of that, you went and were proactive and got yes. your blood work done, yep. you most definitely received a letter in the mail. Doris, step in here, and the others that have been on testing for peas have put that letter up. If you got that letter, you say, don't throw away my blood sample, and you most definitely will be in the thousands of people that right. they want. So there should be like another or statement that says, or Thank you. you were involved Thank in the DHHS. It term, might make DHHS. your presentations go a right. bit smoother. Without that or, that right? So I understand. I do. I, I agree. Thank you. No, thank you. And I, I hope that that was. Thank you for <laughs> bringing that up. Thank you. Miss. Yep. Yeah. What can I do to get my VA doc? What kind of information can I bring her? as to what kind of blood tests that the VA would have to take? Well, we do have a fact sheet in the back on the table that describes different tests you can have, blood tests and others. That might be a, a good place to start. I've not had experience with working directly with the VA on that particular form, but that may be a good place to start. We also have access to occupational physicians 
that may be help giving advice to your physician as to what to look for? But I, I'm not certain that may be a good place to start. Colonel, did you wish to? Well, I, I just want to keep, we have two more speakers to go. So um, I don't want to shut any questions down, but yep. Going back to the very first slide, can you tell me again where, when you modeled the, um, the exposure, did yeah. you take equal contributions from each of the wells? Yes. Yeah, the reason I don't for that. No, that that's right. We, that, what we said was, so we worked with um, a civil engineer who looked at how were these wells used in the past. And essentially what we were indicated to us was that when they needed water, they took them equally from each well. It, you know, that was an approach that we used based on information provided to us. I mean, I don't know if the Haven well gave more or less than others. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's the first <coughs> approach, you know, that we used. Um, and that's how we got with our, our conclusions indicated the concern. I just want to, if I may, talk a little bit more. Um, so, the net, so that's the PEACE study. Again, there's a lot of studies. I want to make some clarity as to what these studies all are. The next slide. Um, so there's also something known as the PFAS exposure assessments. These are conducted in eight communities nationwide on current and former military bases that have had PFAS exposure in drinking water. PEAS is a part of this, but it almost is by default because of all the work we're doing. Essentially, we are doing an exposure assessment. It's just not said as such. But the closest one is um, in Westfield, Massachusetts. So um, my team went to about 900 homes to solicit people to join up for that study. In that study, we'll be looking at uh, urine and blood samples, as well as a subset of those will have drinking water levels. That will not look at health outcome data. That will strictly look at levels in your blood, levels in the water, and see if there's a correlation. So that's the exposure assessment for that. Um, I do want to just, because I know that it is confusing what the exposure assessment is. The next slide has a very brief video describing this, and it's, it's quite nice. It's just a minute or two. What are PFAS? PFAS are man-made chemicals that have been used in industry and consumer products worldwide since the 1950s. They have been used in nonstick cookware, water repellent clothing, stain resistant fabrics and carpets, some cosmetics, some firefighting foams, and products that resist grease, water, and oil. What is a PFAS exposure assessment? An exposure assessment is a way to look at whether people in a community may have been exposed to PFAS in their environment. The primary goal is to provide information to communities about levels of PFAS in their bodies. The results of these assessments will help communities better understand the extent of their environmental exposures to PFAS. First, CDC ATSDR staff will meet with community members and answer questions about the exposure assessment. Next, households will be randomly selected and invited to participate. Participants will provide blood and urine samples. A sampling center will be set up in the community. Environmental samples will be collected from some participants' homes. Then, environmental and biological samples will be processed and analyzed at a lab. After that, individual test results will be sent to participants. CDC ATSDR will analyze all the results and write a report describing their findings and recommendations. Once completed, CDC ATSDR staff will host a community event to discuss results. For more information, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Visit atsdr.cdc.gov slash PFAS or email PFAS at cdc.gov. Another leg in the um, investigator work that we're doing to determine levels of exposure, health outcomes, and levels in the blood. The next one is called the multi-site study. So again, we've had the P study, the exposure assessment. Now this is the multi-site study. Essentially, it's going to be the first major health study to look at health effects from PFAS exposures in drinking water. Um, it's going to assess lipids, thyroids, you know, such as cholesterol, thyroid level function, kidney function, immune system, and liver function tests. 
Um, there's a request for proposal, and we had sent it out nationwide. Seven participants were selected from those that were um, submitted, and I'm going to discuss those briefly. Um, but essentially, again, the P study is going to be folded into this multi-site study. So you didn't need to apply at P's. You're already in it, but it's a separate study that's now being merged with this study. Um, and it was uh, part of the National Defense Authorization Acts of 2018 and 2019, which many senators and congressmen helped us get enacted so we could get the funding for us. It's a several million dollars. I'm not sure the exact amount, but it's going to be a multi-year study. Um, so I will just go to the next slide to it, just to show you the partners that we're working with that have got funding to do this effort. Um, the closest one here is the Silent Spring Institute, um, and there we were working on the Hyannis, Massachusetts, and Air, Massachusetts. So again, these uh, seven partners are going to collaborate with the PEAS study to get a holistic ap uh, approach to see what does PFAS exposure do to people. It's a way to have more power to determine what the outcomes could be. So this is, uh, again, uh, the multi-site study. And I want to go to two more studies, and then I'll be done. I'm just trying to clarity, put clarity as to we are focusing. We're here for you and trying to focus on what a PFAS do to people. The next slide uh, is just a discussion really quickly of the health consultations. So the first one looks at public water. We, we reviewed drinking water exposures that indicated to workers and children. Uh, it was released in 2019, April, for public comment. We had about a 60-day comment period, and we received about 80 comments. We got a lot of comments. I'm addressing all of those. Me and a colleague in Atlanta did this report. And so we had evaluating each comment, modifying the document as needed because they're very good comments, incorporating those. For, and currently, they're in an internal scientific review and will be released shortly um, at a public meeting. The last one is the health, the health consultation. Looking at private wells, again, these are within one mile radius of the Pease Trade Port. That's in Newington and Greenland. It's about 40 or so wells. It's currently, I'm working on it, and it's going, undergoing scientific internal review. We hope to have that released for public comment, and we'll have um, a public meeting sort of like this. We'll also have um, availability sessions. People can drop in and ask us questions. We may go door to door to people's homes to talk to them if they wish, since there's about 40 or so private wells we'll be looking at. So that, again, on the last slide just summarizes the studies that ATSDR has been working on. I hope this does provide some clarity and maybe a level of assurance that we are working on these and many different factors all at once. Um, any questions, you can feel free to contact me in confidence if you wish. Contact information is here, and I'll be on the table in the back, table number three. So if there's any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Okay. Thanks very much, Derek. Appreciate that. All right, next is going to be NIOSH and uh, Dr. Calkins is going to speak, and uh, we'll hear about their organization and some of the studies they're doing. Let's get to stand up. If anyone else needs to stand up for a minute, please feel free to do so. Sitting is not good for our health. So. Great, so I'm uh, Miriam Calkins. I'm from NIOSH. For anyone who's not familiar with NIOSH, uh, we are part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we do occupational safety and health research and surveillance. So I'm going to give a very quick background, um, some information about occupational research and why we um, are looking at PFAS, and then talk about a few studies that are basically in their infancy. They're just starting. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions, probably for the sake of time, um, maybe a few after this, but we'll be in the hallway as well. So, um, so we often find that some of the highest exposures for various chemicals um, occur in working populations. So this, this can happen at um, basically any stage in a, a chemical's life. So we've talked a lot today with PFAS about products that contain um, the PFAS compounds. So foam, uh, cosmetics we mentioned, stain resistant materials. Uh, but I think for an occupational discussion, we really need to talk about the people who make the products, integrate them into, into or make the compounds, excuse me, 
integrate those chemicals into products, use the products, maintain the equipment, and interact with the, um, the products in various ways, and then all the way down to even remediation of some of the sites that are contaminated. So there are workers all across the spectrum that may be exposed um, and that we need to find ways to protect, basically. Um, there are often differences in exposure um, based on the industry, the occupation, uh, the task, and the very specific work activities that somebody may be completing. Um, these may have to do with the, either the quantity of a, um, a product or a compound that someone's using, the concentration of the chemical in that product, maybe the frequency that they're coming in contact with it. So um, we all probably at some point in our lives eat some fast food, uh, maybe some more than others, but um, if you're someone who's working in a fast food restaurant, dealing with those materials every day, you probably have an even higher exposure to just handling that material. Um, and then additionally, there may be different routes of exposure. So I think this is particularly important when we talk about PFAS because often the route that we're concerned with is drinking water, right? So we're, we're worried about how it's getting into our bodies from drinking. Workers um, may be exposed through their skin, they may be exposed through inhalation, they may be exposed through hand-to-mouth contact, uh, and often there just isn't quite as much information about those types of routes of exposure. So we're really trying to figure out um, how people might be exposed and, and how to tackle this. So occupational uh, exposure research is important um, not only for identifying um, and understanding how an individual may be exposed to uh, a compound or uh, a certain agent and then how that relates to maybe some, some sort of a health effect that they're experiencing, but also because it gives us a sense for the spectrum in which we are um, basically experiencing this compound and some of those higher exposures and how those relate to health. Um, so for PFAS in particular, there's been some changes in the past few decades, um, transitioning, excuse me, transitioning from some of the longer chain compounds to shorter chain or alternative compounds and um, that's left a lot of room for unknowns, in my opinion. Um, we don't know what's being used, we don't know where it's being used, which industries have moved away from it, um, and which are just using a different product that maybe we don't know what's in it right now. So um, we have three studies that we are conducting. Um, two of them are specific to firefighter populations, and then one is um, targeting other industries, at least that's currently the plan. The um, results of all these studies will, when they're done, be available to the public um, and communicated to the public. Uh, we're also hoping that they'll inform future research and um, be used to help basically develop um, recommendations for how to manage and reduce exposure to PFAS. Um, just a quick disclaimer, um, I, I mentioned that these are all in their infancy. Uh, some of the details are subject to change, so we are still developing protocols and um, just as a, you know, please be aware of that. There are some things that may be tweaked over the next um, six to nine months as we finalize plans. So. so for the two firefighter studies, both of these build on an existing large collaboration um, called the Firefighter Cancer Cohort Study, um, or the FFCCS. This is a collaboration between NIOSH, the University of Arizona, the University of Miami, the fire service, and a few um, firefighting organizations and it's a, an existing study. We already have firefighters enrolled and we're looking at various exposures. Um, it's a, um, a prospective study, so we're enrolling people now and then following them into the future. Uh, we're also focusing on cancer outcomes with this study as well. So we're not looking so much at acute outcomes or some of the other uh, maybe target organs that some chemicals may affect, but really looking, trying to dig into cancer. Uh, so uh, one of the firefighter studies is a PFAS specific study. Basically, this is a three-year study, and we are um, trying the best we can um, with what we have available to uh, measure acute and chronic exposure to PFAS, so um, short-term, long-term exposure, and uh, some epigenetic markers of cancer. These are basically, um, doesn't mean that person has cancer, it just means that there may be some indication that they may get cancer in the future. It's a subclinical um, marker basically of an effect. We're doing some acute toxicity testing, um, doing a few surveys to try to characterize how people have used these um, foams in particular is one of the ones that comes up, but also turnout gear um, and other potential exposure pathways of interest. Um, I think 
the what I call off-label use of the phone <coughs> often comes up when we talk about how people may have been exposed in the past. So um, capturing that information and then also doing some bulk sample testing. Um, we are using some existing participants for this study and then we're also enrolling some airport firefighters or ARF firefighters. Um, and we're actually in the process of currently enrolling people already at a, a couple different fire departments. Uh, the second firefighter study is a one-year study. Um, this study specifically looks at wildland urban interface firefighters, and PFAS is one of the things we're analyzing for. So um, that one will be done uh, much sooner, but it is specific to that population. The third study we're, complete, or we're working on uh, is a targeted industry assessment. This is a three-year study. Um, where we're focusing on some of the moderate to high exposure industries. So currently we're anticipating that will include manufacturing and services sectors, but as I mentioned before, that may be subject to change. Um, and it's really focusing on some of the ongoing uh, PFAS exposures. So what are people exposed to right now in the work environment so that we can help plan and, um, and work on exposures in the coming years. There are three goals for this study. The first is to understand um, what industries and compounds are still using PFAS uh, and what those compounds are, I should say, um, since we have had some of that transition over the past couple of decades. The second is to conduct an exposure assessment where we'd actually go to a work site, monitor the worker, collect blood and urine as well as air um, to test for PFAS. And then we are including some health indicators as part of the study. Um, it, these would be blood tests for things such as cholesterol, um, hormones, thyroid function, and immune function. Um, this study, uh, we're finalizing the protocol um, probably in the next year, and then we'll be uh, collecting data about a year from now. So um, I, that's, that's what I've got. I'm trying to keep it short and sweet since I know we're tight on time. But if there's any very quick questions, I can probably take them now. Otherwise, we'll be here, and I'm happy to speak with you in the hallway. I see you in the hand of the back. All right, is Niagara planning to do any studies if I miss this, please let me know, that are specifically directed towards PFOAs, PFAS, 4Ps? No, not at this time. Uh, okay. this, the results of the study should translate to people um, at Peace Air Force Base, so we're trying to study some populations that are similar, um, but currently um, Peace employees are not, or Peace workers um, are not in any of the studies. Okay. So, yeah. Nope, okay. All right, I think this was important uh, for you to hear. There's, we had five of the original, three more here. We're going to talk to Derek in a second about a, a ninth one that we'll have here. But all these studies do build on each other. Um, I think we, we've seen some evidence in the scientific world that uh, maybe in animals there's, there's some health effects from PFAS people. We know the study we're looking for here is beyond that. It's occupational exposure as well. But these will all parlay uh, into having some, some claims to be able to make. So uh, I think they're all important. But Derek, if you could uh, talk a little bit, uh, I know it's, we don't have a lot of information sure. about where we're going with our <clears throat> So I'll make my comments brief. Uh, so studies, studies and more studies, right? Um, and I think everyone's here because they really want to learn more about what P's means to them and what their time here, their service here, um, what that meant to them as far as their health outcomes. And so, you know, if, again, the reason why you keep hearing about PFAS and PFO or the previous eight studies is because it's an emergent contaminant, right? And, and so there's not a lot of data on that. So that's why there's such a big focus on a national level to learn more about PFAS and PFO. So based upon the conversations that had taken place a year ago, the Public Health Working Group wanted to shift a little to the right and say, well, well we've heard a lot of conversations, a lot of concerns about uh, misuse of JPA fuel, water contamination, high rates of cancers from folks that served here, high rates of infant mortality from folks that served here. Um, so we knew that was a top priority that came out of last year's conversation. And we collectively put together a request um, that went to the Guard Bureau and subsequently went to USAF SAM, which is the School of Aerospace Medicine out of uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Um, that's where the, the, the Air Force's epidemiologists and scientists uh, work out of. Um, and we asked them, our request was to conduct a cancer study uh, for those members that served from 1970 to the present day. Cancer study from those members that served from 1970 to the present day. So that is still our push. Uh, we wish that we would have more information to pro provide today. We were hoping that 
today's forum was to announce a study. Um, when we put that initial request in, that goes back to, I want to say, the spring. Um, we got a little bit of pushback because these scientists were already working on previous studies for the Air Force. Um, and they said that this fall is when they'd have more time, to, once they wrapped up those studies, to focus on this, on this request. As it stands today, um, they have access, their counter proposal to our 1970s and present day request was to conduct a cancer study um, from 2000 to 2019. And what they're saying is, the reason being is because that's the only initial data they have access to. They have readily access to those medical records over that 20 year period. What they've also said is those folks that served in the 80s and 90s and retired post 2000 would be a part of that study as well because they have access to those studies, uh, to, to those medical records. So we're working with them. We we'll hope to have a conference call in the next couple of weeks to learn more about what their proposal is. Uh, we, we don't think it meets the mark in its entirety based upon our initial request, uh, but uh, we can only work on what the data that they have uh, access to. The reason being why they don't have access to the other data is because um, the other data has been archived and that data would have to be um, requested by the individual or the individual's widow specifically. And obviously they can't do that for that large cohort. Um, so we continue to work on that study. We hope in the next couple of months we'll have more information to provide. But as Colonel Pogorek pointed out, that's called the 157th health study. So if you hear P's health study or uh, assessment or exposure analysis, forget about those. The one that we're focused on is, on the, is called the 157th health study. So if you hear more about that and you want to enroll, uh, we'll keep you attuned. We know Doris has a listserv. Those folks, we encourage you to sign up to Veterans Services listserv because we try to push information out that way as well uh, so you don't have to look for it yourself. So please um, sign up to any one of those two listservs so we can continue to keep you engaged. Okay, I want to uh, thank everybody that came here. Uh, you all that have the interest uh, in your own health and everybody else that has served here. Uh, I know the tag supports the Sport New Hampshire concept. If uh, you were in the National Guard or you served anywhere in any service and you are you live here or work here in uh, New Hampshire, we're all about taking care of you. So we take this seriously and, and we owe you that. So thank you for coming here. It is a team effort though. We need all of our experts here, our CODEL support. We need our retirees. We need all of you. We need more people to be at this meeting because that's where we're going to get the attention and resources that we need. So thank you for everybody that uh, presented today. Uh, I know we've gone a little bit long. Behind me is a hallway, but behind that is bathrooms. So <laughs> you, can, you can go through this door and another door to a bathroom. The men's room is right behind me. The women's room is right over here. Uh, we can ask some questions right here right now, or we can uh, take a bathroom break and push out in the hallway. What would you like to do? All right, let's do that, and we'll meet you all in the hallway then. Thank you.